Hydration and Inter Intravenous Therapy Part 3, Martha Olson, Introduction to Nursing Concepts for Iowa Lakes Community College. The purpose of IV therapy is to provide a way for us to give meds or fluids or things in emergency situations. IV can either be a running line or we can have a saline lock or just a plug with the IV port there but nothing running in it. It gives us a way to give nutrition if they're unable to take uh, food in and that would be through the PIC line or a central line and it's called TPN, Total Parenteral Nutrition, the information we had back in the, the nutrition unit. The skin is the largest organ of the body. The function of the skin is to protect the body from outside organisms. It's a barrier between the environment and the internal structures. So any compromise to that skin puts the patient at risk for an infection. Some of the factors that increase the patient's risk for infection are things such as age, immune status, and illness. As a nurse, what we can control is the site preparation, that we clean it correctly, that we select the best vein, we maintain that site in the cleanest, sterilest environment we can, careful handling of equipment, tubing, and fluids, and follow the protocols of, you know, safe and uh, keeping the system as closed as we can. The fewer times that we open, and uh, replace tubing or open and replace things, uh, the less chance of an infection that we have. Hospital acquired infections would include infusion therapy. It's one of the leading causes of patients developing a hospital acquired or nosocomial infection that we can get. As we look at the anatomy for the vein, we know veins and arteries basically have three layers. That deepest inner layer is called the tunica intima. It's the gray one on this sheet middle layer is the salmon colored tunica media and then that outer layer is the tunica adventitia or the pink. The tunica adventitia then surrounds the vessel. The middle layer is more responsible for controlling the flow through the artery and the diameter. So when we talk about vasoconstriction and dilation it's that middle or media layer. And then the tunica intima is that innermost layer. We know arteries carry oxygenated blood to the tissues they're not routinely used for infusion therapy. When we look at the veins, they contain valves which prevent the blood from pooling. It helps move the blood or helps prevent the blood from going backward and veins take the blood back then to the heart. Veins are classified as either superficial or deep. We can't find the deep ones, um, but the superficial ones are just under the surface of the skin, makes it ideal for site selection. We need to make sure that we provide privacy, teach the patient about putting the IV in, ask them if they've ever had one before, and educate them on that. We need to let the patient ask questions. Sometimes they will tell you, I'm a real hard IV stick, my veins tend to roll. Don't lose your self-confidence at that time. Just remember you know, that you can do that. Hopefully the patient is well hydrated. You're in a controlled environment where you can put this IV in. in a, in a very positive way. Remember the number of sticks that you get is two and anything beyond that you need to have another nurse try or call the physician because some of them get very angry if uh, they think we're using their patients as a pin cushion. For physical preparation then we always want to make sure that the patient is uh, comfortable if they need to go to the bathroom we do that before we start the IV. Ask them if they're left or right dominant hand so that we can put it in the opposite hand. We think of um, safety. Remember they're going to have to drag an IV pole around with them so some of your patients uh, that can be a deterrent for them. And then make sure we tell them let me know if it's red, tender, you have pain at the site, notice any swelling or anything unusual so I can uh, be sure to come in and look at it. We have the patient in semi-fowlers. I always put a clean towel under or a clean barrier underneath where I'm going to start that because if you get good blood flow back you don't want to have to do a whole bed change underneath of you because the blood got on the bedding and I always put some kind of towel on my lap in case I would um, get blood on my pants it prevents that from happening. When we look at the site selection then things we need to think about are what type of solution is running in, how active is the patient, have they had a previous surgery, are they going to surgery, um, you know, if they're going to have a left mastectomy, obviously we're going to put the IV in the right. 
um, any type of allergies. Anticoagulant therapy is how much are they going to bleed out if we start this IV because they're on you know blood thinners. And then we look at um, the presence of a shunt or graft or fistula. Put a star by that one. We never start an IV on a side where they've had a mastectomy because of the lymphedema on a site where there's a graft for dialysis because that will damage the graft. So we have to sometimes kind of go in and take an assessment of what we want to do. Never start the IV near a valve or an area where it bifurcates off because it could damage that and the blood then would pool to that distal extremity. As we look at the picture from page 906, we can see on the back of the hand we have several very um, nice sites to choose from. The dorsal metacarpal vein is located near the back of the hand. They're easy to find. They have less sub-Q tissue surrounding them and it's usually your most distal site. And remember we start the IV at a distal site so that if we are unsuccessful or have a vein that blows, we can move up the arm and attempt higher up. Try to think about the uh, use of the patient's hand. If it is a woman that's in labor or somebody that's going to be using their hand a lot to push or have it bent, that cephalic vein is not a good site because you're going to occlude that off. On the inside of the arm then are a couple of sites that we can select. Uh, the cephalic vein runs along the thumb side of the wrist. It's a large vein. It's easy to access. IV placed too close to the wrist, it can impede uh, joint movement and dislodge the catheter. The patient can also have numbness and tingling to the thumb and possibly permanent nerve damage uh, because that radial nerve lies very close to that cephalic vein that you see listed there. The median vein is located on the anterior forearm starting at the wrist ending just below the antecubital fossa. It's hard to see but it's actually very easy to stabilize and access. The lower portion of this vein is not a good choice because it's very, very painful when you start it down just, just uh, superior to where that wrist is. The basilic vein runs along the little finger of the arm. It's large. It's not used much because of its location. It tends to roll when we attempt to access that site. And when attempting to start an IV in this site, uh, you should always place the patient's forearm across his or her chest and access the vein maybe from the opposite side of the bed is one of the recommendations they make. Veins in the foot or leg should not be used routinely. They can compromise circulation and lead to infection, especially for your diabetic that has poor circulation to start with, blood clots, and then limited ability to walk. With our IV therapy, uh, before using, make sure we check the solution for clarity. Is the IV bag, you know, outdated? Does it have any leaks? Is there any um, solution problems that we can see before we hang that bag? We want to make sure that we prime the tubing or run the fluid through the tubing before we take it to the patient's room or you would give them a very large air embolism. As we look at the IV tubing basics, we'll be playing with these in the lab and you'll get a better idea of the names of the different parts for that. The piercing pin is that sh sharp pointed part that spikes through the bag. The jip drip chamber we want to be about half full so we can still watch it drip but yet it's not pulling air down into the tubing. Our roller clamp is important because on your checklist you will notice that one of the first things it tells you to do is to close the roller clamp before you ever use the piercing or spike pin to uh, go into the bag or you will get all kinds of air in there. So your most important thing at the beginning is to remember to shut your roller clamp off so that you are not getting air in the tubing before you ever begin. As we get started, as always, wash your hands. They're clean gloves that we put on, not sterile. We're going to apply a tourniquet, and one of the things that the book talks about is tourniquets sometimes can be damaging. For some of our older patients, if you put a blood pressure cuff on and pump it up, you will sometimes get the, a better effect and less pain for them. Think about our access site. You know, has the patient had a um, mastectomy, a dialysis fistula or, or fistula or graft? Have they had a stroke and they have an extremity that is affected by that CVA that we would want to eliminate? Um, has the extremity been damaged or burned? You know, any patient with a burn to that arm, you would not want to use that. 
So we, you know, look at uh, veins, start palpating and looking at arms and thinking which site would probably be the easiest one. Which one can I see as we put the um, tourniquet on? We will be practicing with tourniquets in class because there are a couple of things that help make that easier to pull off when you have actually um, access the IV. Be confident. Don't ever tell them this is my first IV that I've started. Try to get yourself comfortable. Have all your equipment there with you so that you have everything already in the right position uh, before you start. And obviously your clinical instructor will be right there to help you as you get going. When we start the actual IV then our insertion is to pull that skin taut. So we've cleaned the skin, we've selected our site, cleaned the skin, by pulling the skin taut, it's easier to pierce through. Once uh, we grab that flashback chamber of the IV, we want the bevel to be up. It's a low 15 degree angle that we just glide along the skin, pierce down through the skin, and as soon as you see flashback, we advance the slow uh, catheter very, very slowly, release the tourniquet, and then we're going to hold pressure with our fourth finger above where uh, the IV is in. So once we remove that stylet and connect the tubing, we don't have blood flowing back out of that. We will open the roller clamp to make sure that uh, we are in the vein. If you're not and you open the roller clamp and let some fluids in, you will notice that it will bubble and, and have a bleb underneath there. And then at that point, you know that you are not in a good site and you need to take that out and start over. Once you're successfully in and your IV is running, you will want to stabilize the IV. Every site, every facility does it just a little differently. Your biggest thing is to make sure that what you're putting against that IV cannula is sterile. You don't ever want to take a piece of, um, a roll of tape out of your pocket, cut off a piece of tape and put that closest to the hub because that is what is going to be next to that area of open skin. We apply uh, the tape or the opsite over that. It's a clear dressing. We want to date that with the date and time so that we know when that dressing was changed, when the IV was started. And as we look on page 907 of the Focus on Older Adults, box 416, it kind of gives some clues for that. Our documentation is listed here. We need to make sure we put all of these things.